So what is the problem with dimensional tolerancing and why is it we need GPS tolerancing to make our drawings better? Well, to illustrate that, I have made this drawing of a shaft and, and I've given it some partial dimensional tolerancing. It's not the entire tolerancing, but, but this is typically how we see dimensional tolerance is used for a component like this. We often hear that people say, well, I do dimensional tolerancing like this and I get the components I need and it works just fine, so why do I need to do something different? And well, in this case, you, you get what you need mostly because the people in your workshop know what it is you need, not really because your drawing expresses it. And so if we look at it in a little more detail, we see we have a dimensional tolerance for the diameter of this bearing surface here. The tolerance is 20G6 and it's a, a tolerance code out of ISO 286. And for the other bearing surface, I've basically given it the same tolerance, but written it out this time because a G6 tolerance for a 20 millimeter shaft is from minus seven microns to minus 20 microns. So we have diameter tolerances on, on the two bearings. Then I put a length tolerance here or, or on the width of the first bearing. And I put a tolerance here on the distance between the two bearings. And then I put a tolerance here for the total length from from this face here and back to the back face here. And so with these three tolerances, I've also indirectly given the width of this second bearing. And so let's look at what kind of deviations we can get that would still fall within what is acceptable according to these tolerances. So if we first look at the possibilities of what could happen with the two bearing surfaces, then we could have something like this happen where the two bearings are not aligned with each other, but are, one is a little high and the other is a little low. And of course, I, I've drawn it exaggerated to illustrate the point. And the point is that the dimensional tolerancing doesn't give any tolerance for how well these two bearings have to be coaxial. And so Yes, if it's made in one operation, then they will probably be coaxial. But this is just a simple example. And if you have a more complex component where it may not be clear to those who, who are manufacturing it what exactly the function is, then it is very possible that they might decide on a process sequence that doesn't guarantee that these two bearings are aligned with each other. And so you, you might see something in principle like this. The other thing that could happen in this particular case is, is something like this, where now they're not translated, they're not moved linearly, but now the two bearings are at an angle to each other. And again, they may have the, the correct diameter, but in this case, again, your component will not function and there's nothing in the dimensional tolerancing that says this is not acceptable. So, so that is one of the limitations in dimensional tolerancing is that it basically doesn't tell those who have to make the component what are the acceptable deviations in terms of the geometries and the alignments rather than just the simple diameters and lengths. Now, in addition to the orientation of the bearings, there can be other problems with the dimensional tolerancing. You can split dimensions into what we call sizes and non-sizes. And in this context, a diameter, for example, is a size because a cylinder is what we call a feature of size. So the, the two bearings are defined as sizes. A size generally will have points opposing each other, and that's how we define sizes. So here, where we have a distance between one surface and, and really it's another surface that's facing in the same direction. So you can think of it as this surface is facing in this direction and this little surface here is facing in that same direction. Uh, if we go out to this one, and that's the one we're really going to be interested in, that's facing in the same direction too. So that's not what we call a size. And so the dimensions in this case are not really well defined. And there's, there's a lot of good reasons for that, but let's just say they're not well defined. If you have uh, a tolerancing like this, one thing you could get is, is something like this, where this surface back here 
is not parallel to the surface back here. And so in this case, we can get different results depending on how we measure and interpret it. We can either measure parallel to the face back here, that's where I have made the blue line, and so these blue arrows represent those measurements. And so that would give us one range of values. But we could equally interpret our dimensional tolerance and say, well, we have the direction of this surface back here, and we'll measure in that direction, and that gives us a different range of values. And so if we have something that looks like this, then it is not clear how it should be interpreted, and therefore it's not clear whether this particular component should be acceptable within the tolerances. And of course, again, I have drawn this quite exaggerated, but it's sort of to show the point that, that it, it could have an angular error that put us in the range where it, it may be debatable whether it's acceptable or not. The other situation we could have is, is something like this, where the two faces are parallel, and so we get consistent values, sort of no matter how we measure, because the direction is, is well defined if, if they're both in the same direction. But it's probably not what we want, because when we want to put this into another component, and for example, if we make our other component and we say that it is some kind of a housing, And maybe the housing is, is this wide. And so come over to the other side here. And so the housing will start here and then come out to here. So here we have the housing. And so you see, if we were trying to put let's say some kind of washer on back here that that is supposed to be the end stop and then of course we have a, a nut here to hold it then even if we calculated our our length here appropriately then it would still touch here and so the shaft would not be able to rotate in the housing, even if we're within our dimensional tolerances. And again, yes, it's drawn to exaggerate the problem, but really that is part of, of the problem with dimensional tolerances, is that it doesn't really set any limitations in this case for how far from perpendicular these surfaces can be compared to the bearing surfaces. And so it's really not because of the tolerancing on the drawing, but in spite of the tolerancing on the drawing that you may get something that actually works, because the people in the workshop know what the functional requirements really are, and so can make good parts, even though they only get the dimensional tolerances to work with, where they really should have some information about how good the geometry should be as well. Here is, in one simple illustration, the problem with dimensional tolerance, that we think of them as being in a neat coordinate system, and so that there's a guarantee that they're perpendicular and parallel to each other, but there's nothing in the tolerancing rules that says that that is the case. So when you only use dimensional tolerancing, you get this kind of a problem. That is usually where we see people starting to add geometrical tolerancing, when they start getting components that have faces that are not parallel, not perpendicular. And so then they start using what we call band-aid tolerancing, where they start using geometrical tolerancing as band-aids and a fundamentally dimensional tolerancing, which helps a little bit, but doesn't really get you the full benefits of geometrical tolerancing or GPS tolerancing. But we will look at the, the band-aid kind of tolerancing next.